I'm your art facility. I'm your local library. I'm your local library. Well, I'm your nipper's nursery. I'm your nipper's nursery. against the most vicious onslaught against the working classes and the most vulnerable and poor in our society. But I do think that what's happening at the moment is a kind of shock and awe politics where they're using a perceived crisis to create excuses to do something that they always wanted to do anyway. This is one crisis that began in 2007. It's been going on for four years. It began as a crisis of finance in the United States in the first instance because of the incredible explosion of real estate speculation uh, and related financial activities. It then became a crisis of what we might call the real economy, a recession, leading to uh, loss of output and unemployment and people uh, having difficulty making ends meet in the United States and elsewhere in the world because it became global when it did that. And then, once, this, once states had intervened in order to make the recession less severe, around about 2008, 2009, the crisis became a crisis of the public sector. It became a crisis of the state, um, because basically the state across the world picked up the bill. It was a bailout of the private banking system. The ownership of the banks is not publicly owned. It's a government-owned holding company whose sole purpose is to sell the shares in those banks at the earliest possible opportunity when they reach a certain level. The measures imposed on us here are to, to rescue, protect finance, and also to change the balance of social and economic forces against labor and in favor of capital so business can continue to make profits. The FTSE 100 chief executive officers last year, their bonuses increased by 55%. The average wage, 3.7 million pounds a year, 145 times greater than the average worker's wage. The thousand richest people in this country collectively own 395 billion pounds two and a half times the national UK deficit. The deficit reduction programme this government is just a cover story. The real agenda is a permanent shutting down of the welfare state, a permanent reduction of the role of the state. A couple of weeks ago, I stood outside Parliament when the NHS bill was getting read for the third time. I cried when I found out it had been passed. Now we don't have this institution where we can say it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, you don't deserve to die if we can treat you. And now they're taking that away. They're taking away a fundamental benchmark of decency. And to me, that is what these cuts are about. The welfare state to me is about a fundamental level of decency where we say, we believe that you as a human being have a right to certain things and whatever happens, we will look after you. And we are the fifth richest country in the world and we can do that and so we will. And that is what this country is destroying. There was a, a, a survey come out by UNICEF three years ago, 
and you have the top 21 richest countries. And it's about the well-being of young people, how happy they were. Guess where Britain comes? Anybody guesses? 20, 20th out of 21. For the most unhappy children in the richest nation. Oh, by the way, guess who came first? Oh, sorry, bottom of that list. Oh, well done, go to the class. The United States, absolutely, came bottom. Is it a coincidence? The two societies that have the most penetrative, marketized system, a system where competition is the most important thing. The process of cutting public expenditure in order to pay off the debt, look at the effect it's had. Greece is the most extreme example. Privatization in Greece is rampant. State enterprises are being sold off for nothing. Land, millions of acres of land are being sold off for almost nothing. And the Greek government is paying short-term bonds of up to 50% interest on short-term rates. There's billions being made out of the poverty of Greece at the present time, just as in Spain, Portugal, Ireland, and it's coming here very, very soon. I want to send some gratitude to our young people and our students, because it's they who started this ball rolling when they demonstrated in their tens of thousands had the protest outside of Milbank. Those protests broke the consensus that cuts were inevitable. We need debt in this country to be examined from below, as it were, to make sure that we know just as much as the government knows why debt is increased, and then we decide how to respond to the pressures of debt. We had a greater level of debt just after the Second World War, and we spent our way out of it by building railways, schools, hospitals. So this notion that there is no alternative is complete rubbish. The public sector is too small. The lack of services, the lack of resources, <laughs> The way to get out of a problem and a recession is to invest in people, raise pensions, raise benefits, invest in health, invest in education, invest in railways, invest in infrastructure, and above all, in our community, invest in housing. Housing is the biggest issue facing the people of this borough by a long way. 13,000 people on the waiting list. A third of our community lives in private rented accommodation. I've come across people who've been asked to pay £50 a week out of their benefit of £70 a week to top up the rent for the private sector. Council tenants have been told by the government, pay 80% of market rate for your tenancy and that will give the, your council some money to build new houses. Islington, to its credit, has refused to do that, but it means we don't get the money for building as a result of it. Let's start a real people's debate. Is it right to have £7 billion pounds worth of bankers' bonuses, or should we use that money to create 228,000 nurses' jobs, or 28,000 day centres, an alternative? Should the daycare worker at Cornwall be seeing a 27% pay cut, while her director sees an 8.5% pay rise to £156,000? You could start by collecting the £120 billion pound in unpaid corporation tax. That would be a great alternative to what we're seeing at Cornwall. Let's think about introducing a Robin Hood tax. Every time there's a financial transaction in the city, a 1% transaction tax will create £42 billion pounds and get put into the welfare state. Billions wasted in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and nuclear weapons should be put into the state on the needs of our people rather than wasted on weapons of mass destruction. Let's occupy a few places, town halls if we have to. Let's stop some traffic. Let's make the point from communities. But we're simply not going to sit back and watch you slash and burn our services. We've already told them in a particular area, if you cut our lollipop ladies, we'll block that road from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock every morning in order to show no Pensions issue is a lightning conductor for every single attack which we're going to face and the defence of the welfare state as a whole. The average pension for a board of director is £333,000 a year. A public sector worker? £5,000 to it. That's what the 30 would be about. It would be a kind of a resistance to every single person who wants to stand up and say, thus far and no further. On the 30th of November, we should be seeing 3 million public sector workers striking. That's just the start of the issue. that pension, that we're going to go on to fight for the entire defence of the welfare state. And there's only one way we do it, organised labour and communities working hand in hand. I hope not just for a day of action to save our pensions, I hope we're going to work up to a day of action to force the country to a general election. And let's bring this government down. Thank you very much. So we've been in the council for one year and a bit. And our challenge is how do we um, manage 
the promises which we made last year when we were elected. The first one that we really have focused on is new affordable homes for local people. So what we're doing is we're building council housing. We said to the housing associations who want to build, you have to build social housing. And we're also saying that we're going to continue to give secure tenancies to people because there's another attack on the government. Someone mentioned the localism bill earlier. It gives councils and housing associations the right to constrict tenancies. So they're only two years. So they're like, more like private sector tenancies. The second thing which we um, hear a lot on the doorstep when we go around as local councillors and local campaigners active in the local Labour Party is around crime and antisocial behaviour. And you'd be aware that Islington, unfortunately, has lost quite a lot of young men to knife crime in the last three to four years. One of the things which we're campaigning quite hard against at the moment is job losses within the police service. The third thing which people talk to us about is basic inequality in Islington. We have just now printed a report called the Islington Fairness Commission. And the idea of that was to give us a kind of a blueprint for understanding our budget how our budget should be used to target resources to those in most need. The first recommendation is around wages. So we've managed to reduce the highest paid person, taken away the 50,000, and that's actually, coincidentally, the amount it's cost us to bring all of our lowest paid staff up to the London living wage. I hope that we can forge some relationships here so that together we can do campaigns to address um, some of those really entrenched social problems which we face. We called on the council not to set a budget that made cuts. It wasn't possible, the argument was because um, this would be illegal and if the council did this then Eric Pickles would come in. He will then have the right to suspend the requirement of that council to provide those services and then the consequences for ordinary people locally would be much worse than if the council stayed in place. We're making cuts of up to £100 million over the next few years. The scale of the cuts is so enormous that it brings absolutely hollow to be talking about minimising pain and protecting the most vulnerable. With the localism bill, the rich councils will be able to keep the money from the business tax. That means that the richest communities will get richer and the poorest communities will get even poorer. The choices will get harder and harder and harder. If any councils start going down the line of making cuts, then very shortly not only will we be in a position of making cuts, we'll be in a position of actually helping to remove whole chunks of the state that are absolutely essential for ordinary working people. Islington Council last year was the first council to set its budget. Imagine the situation if Islington Council had been the first government to defy the Condemn government. That is a campaign that we can run. That is a campaign that we can start now. From this moment on, we can start organising the kind of meetings that took place around the, uh, around the Fairness Commission. But this time, we organise them in the communities, in the workplaces, in the unions, to say that we will stand alongside our councillors who are willing to defy the government, who are willing to defy this brutal, vicious attack on our welfare state. Resisting what this government's doing, but the truth is, is if a local government authority does not set a budget, then the elected representatives seek to actually apportion where. Catherine explained earlier some of the areas where our money is spent, prioritising the least well-off in society, and the officers take over. Trade unions and councillors have worked very well together, for instance, in opposing the, 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 the privatisation of our schools and turning them into academies in, 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 in recent months. However, the fact is, is that despite the fact that Catherine is calling on, 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 on the mayor and the government not to cut police in London, the council is currently cutting teachers and educational support workers. Most of them in EMAS, the ethnic minority, achievement service. 63% of the staff who are being sacked are ethnic minorities. And, and this is being done because the council is asking Cambridge Education, which runs the education service, <coughs> to save £700,000. Because this government is wishing to remove um, schools from the, the council's control, um, by the time that the Cambridge Education contract comes up, there will be a very limited amount which we will be required by law to do in schools. That's because the government wants schools to be independent of local authorities. We should be campaigning about the gap in finance, where we need the money, and then 
arguing that lo locally representatives should have a lot more power in deciding where we're Okay, to thank you, Gary. One proposal that has come from my union from, from Unison at a local government conference uh, of, of Unison, National Local Government Conference, was to call to set a parallel budget, to set a budget, this is what we want to spend. We've had no mention of what has been cut, isn't it? On 17th of February this year, the council voted to put through £52 million of cuts in Islington. I was one of the only people who went to the council chamber to oppose the cuts, and actually, instead of entering into the papers, you sent the police to us. If we go back to what was said in the Equality Impact Assessment that was handed out at the council meeting on the 17th, it said that cuts would have a direct impact on residents who receive services from the council. And this will mainly be younger, older, disabled and poorer residents. You can shout at me all you like, but if you want to beat this government and beat the disgusting policies which they're trying to introduce, then you've got to help on those individual policies, the ones that Ken's describing about the academies and all that. Because if we get into a blaming match on the left, mm. then we're doomed. Mm. We've got to work together and we've got to do all we can to defeat this government. I worked in Camden Council in the 1980s and we used to invite Labour councillors to come and argue for fights against rape camping. We need to go back to that tradition because you're absolutely right, Catherine. I do not want to see the disgraceful disunity on the left. It doesn't serve anybody by attacking each other on the left. The trouble is with making cuts is that you demoralise and you divide the forces which can support you and help you win. Leaving on housing now means saying to tenants, march and protest, go to Downing Street. That's what leadership is these days because you can't win this battle in Islington. Some council somewhere has got to get the guts and actually stand on its principles. It's no good coming here and saying fine work and actually the reality is your community is dying here and now and actually people, elderly, young people are really, really, really suffering and actually we don't want this to happen. We need to take a start fight and we need to start that fight now. <laughs> need to stand up uh, to, to the government and ultimately will need to break the law. But to put it in a way which says that the council needs to, to do that first and then the campaign will come afterwards, I think it's a slight problem that some of us are, 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 are suggesting. We need to have a mass campaign that puts pressure on the councillors so that they feel the confidence to be able to break the law. We need to get some confrontation going. If it means the occupation of the towns, we're occupying the towns. And George here, our chairman, says, I don't know, I'm meeting on Thursday, if we need to throw bricks, we'll throw bricks. And the kids are up for a while. And I'm a 72 year old pensioner who's still got a bit of go with me. We all have on the pensioners board, but we have nightly meetings. I've got nothing to lose now. I've got nothing to lose. You can't set budgets, but you organise workers and all the uses. When Pickles tries to confidence to the town hall, you actually are in my purpose, people. You pull workers out on strike, and you make the place ungovernable so they can't put the about what we want for our children. 
what sort of education system we want. There was a little bit of talk about what sort of curriculum we want. The idea that we have the, the national curriculum, but there's also an informal curriculum. And what sort of opportunities do we want for our young people? We need to involve children and young people in this project throughout and in all these spaces. And we want the council to, to start to facilitate that, to start looking how we can get cross-sector working together in order to improve, improve things. The state pension is obviously uh, very, very key to any kind of campaign. The fair pension for all campaign links the public sector uh, state pensions, <laughs> private sector pensions. What would be ideal would be if groups actually, from, from his thinking, went in to local workplaces, particularly the private workplaces, to actually occupy support that they are supporting the strike on the third year, and why actually it is about fair pensions for all. Pure public was our second major issue. Many consider that um, an even greater issue, bearing in mind that some 25,000 people in the latest figures made available to some pressure groups. Uh, died from lack of warmth in their homes. We need to build unity uh, within the, the forums and the other pressure groups across London. That's vitally important. The Whitting Club is preparing to be a broader trust. It's taken over the management of primary care trusts in both Haringey and Islington. We won the battle last year to defend the A&E, but it's now again under threat in all probability. This year alone, there's going to be a 9.5 annual cut in the mental health budget. Mental health clinical staff, 650 of them in fact, are already um, already being forced to reapply for their jobs with downgrading and increased workload. We're facing the closure of two mental health units, in fact, one dealing with elderly people and another at the Royal Free. We're proposing to establish a full I Hopes working group within the organisation, possibly working in conjunction with the Spend the Whittington campaign. We're calling for broader community campaigns and organisations that already exist to be identified and to get our people to be invited as speakers around the NHS. We need to urgently involve more health worker trade unionists in every sector of the health system. We use petition to get GP surgery and dental practices signed up against marketization. We want to organise a conference under the auspices of IHOOPS in 2012, focusing on organising the grassroots. Obviously, we want to get a maximum turnout among healthcare workers on the November 30th strikes. And both IHOOPS and Defend Whittington already have excellent links with the local press. That needs to be maintained. It's 24th for November. It's a date of the consultation that's going through on the future of Homes for Islington. There is a campaign that's banned HFI. They have a petition online. The objectives will agree with the return of housing in-house, where it's more accountable, accountable <coughs> transparent. Really, it's a petition that people's assembly should support. In solidarity, we get our own petition going because it brings more pressure. Homes for Islington have handpicked their their, their uh, tenants reps. So we really don't really have a voice from, from the grassroots upwards. So we want real tenants reps represented. The full housing finance uh, is going to be outlined on the 2nd of April. And we need to get galvanised support against uh, uh, cutbacks in housing finance. We should demand that n none of those people who go into rent arrears as a result the capping of housing benefit are evicted. In fact, the council should refuse to pursue possession orders against them in the courts. Where people are threatened with eviction, should those people seek to resist that eviction, we will get as many people as possible outside those properties to physically prevent them from being. We come up with five points. Point number one is: is it the council to find out how many disabled people live in the borough? because that affects our funding on central government. That's just to say that at the moment, isn't the council have no record whatsoever of how many disabled people are actually living in the borough? The second point is ask Labour Council Council not to evict any disabled people because of interviews caused by the housing benefit cap. Point number three is all disabled people in the borough of Islington to be accompanied by an independent advisor, if they wish, for the ATOS, which is the medical assessment, and PIP, which is personal independent payment assessments, which will, in the near future, replace DLA. Point number four is positive action for disabled people to gain employment with council and outside. <coughs> and the final point is no cuts to personal budgets. We wanted, uh, firstly, get the council to uh, endorse the million climate jobs report. 
but equally, which we think is essential to do because there's so many jobs that could be created, which would reduce unemployment and would actually help people out of fuel poverty, which is one of the things that we looked at. And our home insulation is one of the biggest problems, or leaky homes, whatever else you do, if people's homes are leaking, then all other measures are going to be more ineffective. So what we wanted to do was demand of the council, first of all, a pilot scheme to insulate all people's homes, get a little skills training in colleges. Yeah, how skilled people are to do these jobs. We did focus on the way in which cuts are going to further racism and impact on already disadvantaged groups. One of the first things we want is the support from this assembly for Dale Farm against them being evicted. We also want support for the establishment both of an Islington Unite Against Fascism group and specifically for a group which is being set up uh, by staff and particularly by students at London Met. And finally, we want a breakdown from Islington of what staff are being cut, what services are being cut, and to approach the Trades Council um, as a way of trying to focus in our groups on the areas where cuts are in the process of happening. All forms of art and access to art and theatre and music is a right, not a privilege, which, if they do receive these cuts, becomes a very basic reality. If people want to engage with any forms of art, they have to pay, which will make it far more exclusive. It's not just about defending the arts in itself, but using art and culture to inform this whole campaign. We decided to try and establish a monthly Irish radio show on Redwoods FM with a monthly podcast, which again, kind of allows every single campaign that we've got to articulate itself to a massive audience. Do something along the lines of an Islington X Factor. What that means is that we encourage people to possibly occupy the council chambers to show them what they're going to lose in Islington. These are the talents of the people in Islington that are going to disappear if we don't do this. Or possibly we should bandage up the town hall, you know? We're cuts, we're bleeding, let's bandage the town hall. So we're looking to try and create lots of artistic and creative we have the duty to defend these public services which have made such an impact upon the lives of working people. Many people would simply die without them being there. The act of taking them away is a mass act of vandalism. It used racism to divide and rule over people. Why else would David Cameron, suddenly on the day the Edo were marching, in Luton suddenly come out and say there's a problem with Muslims, there's a problem in, in our society. On the 3rd, when we stopped the EDL, they had marched 58 times through different multicultural cities and they'd been able to get to the centre and everybody told people to stay at home, you the police, don't do anything. But I think that what happened in Tower Hamlet is very important because what you had was alliance of black and white, Muslim and Christian and Jew, LGBT come together and say we're not prepared to listen. And they're not just prepared to listen to the EDL Nazis, they weren't prepared to listen to Theresa May, that said, actually, your law streets don't belong to you. I leave the last words to Dilmar Khan from um, East London Mosque. He said they try to separate everybody, because the teachers, when they came out on strike, came to the mosque to organise together. And we prove that our community is one together against all those divisions. What you're doing in our groups is important, because you're bringing all the struggles together. Because sometimes I think people say them as if they're completely different. And we have to find the interlinking things. In 1945, which is where I came into politics at the age of 10, um, we were, had a mass movement which said no, no to the 1930s. Nobody was going to go back to the 1930s. And the Labour government at that time was told, you either do this or we're not going to support you. And basically that's what it was. And it was Winston Churchill, who, having been defeated, had to go to the United States and negotiate the money so that the Labour government could put through the welfare state and the National Health Service in order to stop what was a mass movement becoming a revolution. It wasn't just happening here, it was happening all over Europe. And it's happening all over Europe today. The last major recession in the 1930s inflicted such untold harm, damage, poverty and I suppose real human suffering is that we constructed the welfare state as a result of that, in reaction to it. And what, we're, what people are recognising now, and that I think it's happened over the last six months really, what they're recognising now is that everything that we put in place then generations ago 
this government is systematically dismantling. If you look in the third world, you see a billion people are without adequate food, without home security. Three billion people live on less than two dollars a day. It's because the free market cannot represent people who don't have money, and capitalism impoverishes the vast masses of people. This is the problem we're facing. This is the problem of financial capitalism. We are the activists here, but we have to build on this, and I think we have to say that actions, direct actions, strike actions, support actions of all sort have to be the norm from now on. Wherever you go now, wherever you go, people are saying I've had enough and they're finding means to fight back. Now at the moment and it ranges from individual actions to group actions and then whole communities coming together. The balance sheet of socialism is here for us to take forward. The balance sheet of capitalism we can all see and we have to destroy it.